So um, I want to just introduce the red thread for this meeting, and then I'm going to ask the panelists to introduce themselves and to talk about how they intersect with this problem in terms of better collaboration between the two functions that dominate our outreach to HCPs, as in medical. Ah, we can't post in the chat. The chat is disabled. I will fix that in a second once the panelists are introducing themselves. Um, so with the red thread, one thing I'm going to make clear at this point is we're going to be talking about field medical and field commercial, because we felt as a panel, as we discussed this, that there's it's a very broad topic, medical and commercial, and actually head office whilst related is a slightly different and separate issue that maybe could deserve its own webinar. So today we're really talking about the touch points of our field teams, both medical and commercial with HCPs and how we can maybe better collaborate between those to create those customer experiences. So I'm now gonna ask um, in a random order, depending on how they're on my screen, uh, each each of us, the panelists to introduce themselves and to talk about their role and how they see this problem in their day-to-day -day lives or if it is a problem. So Lucy, your top left, I'm going to jump to you. Fantastic. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So I am Lucy George. I'm currently Head of Business Innovation Oncology at AZ and had several different roles over the years in commercial, mainly in the pharma industry, from digital to marketing, sales, account management, sales manager, and I've also done a stint in compliance. So I have lots of different perspectives on uh, this topic. And um, I think it's super important to be able to push us forward in terms of how we all work together best to, to do what's right for customers and patients. So looking forward to the discussion. Great, thank you. And Mark? Yeah, hi everybody. Um, Mark Cree Saunders. I'm currently senior director at Estellus, uh, responsible for global field medical. Um, been in the industry probably too long now uh, in commercial roles, L and D, and last twenty five years in field medical. Um, and for me, this is a it's always an important topic, always has been. Um, but I think post COVID with things like omni-channel account management becoming um, buzzwords and very topical, commercial and medical need to work closer, closer together if we're going to do things like omni-channel because you can't do them in silos. Um, and that draws lots of big questions around, do you have joint objectives? Do you have... Um, so there's a whole lot opened up that needs to be um, embraced, I guess, if we're going to maximise benefit to customers and to patients. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, I'm, and I'm definitely going to come back to the account management um, and how collaboration around that is key. Otherwise, it's not account management, it's individual management. Um, Helen. Thanks, James. Hello, everyone. Helen Kane, CEO of One MSL. Uh, so I have a, a long history of working within medical affairs and left to set up one MSL with a view to supporting the delivery of excellence, not only for MSLs, but also the wider medical affairs team. And as part of what we do, we, we, we sort of, I guess we do things in two buckets. We're, we're involved in supporting organizations in, in terms of their understanding uh, of, of the role, but also then really in supporting individuals who many in many instances have joined industry from academia from healthcare who are coming into this world with little understanding of the world of pharma and we just see on every occasion that there is this total lack of understanding about what it means to be engaging externally and to be part of this wider team so i see these challenges firsthand pretty much on every day Thank you. And I should say, I'm going to come to you in a second, Rena. I'm just going to, I've realized I haven't introduced how I intersect with this. And I'm going to say it at this point, because actually I went to attend the MSLA, so the Medical Science Liaison Associations Conference, where I met Mark and I met Helen. Uh, Rena was also present. And I went there and I would think I was the only commercial person in that room. And I went there with a lot of assumptions, just like Helen's saying there's some assumptions from the medical side or a lack of understanding. And I think even though I've been in this world for 27 years in pharma and, you know, medical um, has come in to, to, to the frame in the last 10 years and, and really, really taken off in the last five or whatever phrase you want to 
time period you want to look at is I went with a lot of assumptions about, you know, oh, medical uh, in their ivory tower doing their own thing, et cetera. But a lot of the things that we talked about and were talked about were the same trials, tribulations, issues that we face in commercial. Um, in fact, there was a session from Mark on how do we measure impact KPIs and evaluation, which was almost you could have taken the word medical out and put commercial. And it was the same conversation being had. So in my role, much like Helen, I'm in on the agency side, if you like, and our goal at 28B is to enable and empower field teams to create or orchestrate great customer experiences through great content, data, et cetera. But as Mark talked about, you can't do that in isolation. A customer experience or an experience in HCP has is with the whole organization, non-personally, and then personally with their MSL and personally with their representative. So that's my intersection with it. And my struggles with it is that I want to see one view of the customer. I want the organization to act upon that view and the needs of that customer, but in a compliant way, which is my segue to introduce <laughs> Rena. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, James. So I'm Rena Newton. I'm a ABPI code and compliance expert. I guess, you know, why I'm here um, today is really about the myth that exists that it's somehow compliance's fault or compliance is the reason why. I was saying to James, I picked up um, uh, a medical journal piece and in there, it was on LinkedIn, and in there, the author had written that medical and commercial aren't legally um, allowed to collaborate. Of course, I wrote to this person straight away and said, which bit of the law are you quoting there? And she wasn't able to quote that. And this is where the danger sits, I think, for us, as Helen has you know, sort of eloquently said. It's people you know, joining the industry will pick up medical journals and read this and believe it. And that's really dangerous. So I guess I'm here to bust some of the myths around collaboration. Yes, um, and that's exactly what we're going to do in a second. And I'm one of those people. So up until I went to the MSLA and really thought about this space, I can't. I, I had a lot of assumptions around what you're allowed to do, what what the rules were, et cetera, without really taking the time and effort to understand those rules. So we all felt as panelists that it would be good to get that out up front. And it's not the only reason that Rena was invited to be a panelist, but it's a very important one. And in fact, do you know what? There's a question that's already gone in the chat. Can I remind you to put it in the Q&A from Richard Evans? Why do you differentiate between medical and commercial? Uh, is medical not commercial? But but I, like honestly, they are different functions. They are clearly defined and delineated. And certainly, Rena, I'm assuming, within the code. So therefore, we do refer to them separately. So would you mind sharing with us the, the from a field perspective what the opportunity is as in what we are allowed to do yeah at least in your opinion yeah absolutely so um my opinion is based on the code and it's based on cases and it's based on practices as well so this isn't a theoretical opinion so to start with it's really nice to be able to say there's so much collaboration that can occur at a field level from basic things like introductions and sharing insight to training one another, um, attending meetings, planning, whether that's strategic or key account. It could be creating content, referring questions to one another and so on. So really it boils down to well, what isn't allowed. And there's only genuinely one thing that the code does not allow at a field level. And that is if you're field-based and seeing customers, and you're doing activities that we regarded as promotional, well, then you're a sales representative and you're not a non-promotional MSL. And that's literally it. And if you're a sales representative, you need to have sat the sales exam. So really, in the grand scheme of things, there is one don't and about 10 do's. So it's really how this myth then propagates through companies as to how that's interpreted into a bigger thing. Does that does that help? Is that enough for now? Well, I don't. I I I'd like to put that out to the rest of the panel because I know that some companies. Well, as with everything, there'll be companies' ways of interpreting that code. But certainly, like I thought, it was more restrictive than that. I, I've always thought that it was more restrictive than that. So I'd like to come to each people on the panel to to, to have their take on that. But Lucy, if I can start with you because I know there's maybe more more restrictions uh, restrictive than that from a sorry. Company. 
sorry for coughing. Um, yeah, I think I think obviously the first thing is every company will have their own SOPs and procedures, and so people have to follow them. And and that's that's for every individual to go and find out what what they are and make sure that they're adhering to those. Um, but then also being just really educated on on the code and what's what's out there and, and what's available, I think is really super important. And and making sure that we're sharing, we're doing that in a way that is intended to be transparent and with integrity and again putting patients and customers at the heart of it I think is is the most important thing but yes every company will have its own its own procedures and rules and hopefully that's super clear to people because then that enables them to go and do do things in in the way that is outlined in their teams and if it's not clear I guess that's that's somewhere that could be a starting place is to go and say well how do we make this clear and have the the guardrails that we know we can all work to. And I, and I guess communication is key in that. It's great that someone knows that that exists, but it being clearly communicated out and understood. And e- even to the point where where the guidance and the guide rails are clear, then you can take opportunities within them. Um, so it's not just about stepping over those by mistake, but also what are the things that we can do within those guardrails. So, so Mark, to you, um, does that resonate with you in terms of your experience? And, and what opportunity do you see within those guardrails or the specific ones that Estellas might have? Yeah, no, I agree with what's been said. I think I think there's always grey areas. I mean, if you look at sharing of insights and information, what exactly can you share? It's not black and white. Um, the key the key driver for me, I went on a compliance course, God knows when. But one of the things I took away is in, the intent of what you're doing is so important. If you're doing something for the right intention, whether you're medical or commercial, uh, and you're happy for that to be on the front page of the Sun or the Times, whatever you read, then you're probably on safe ground i wouldn't say it's 100 percent, but if your intent is good and your focus whether your medical or commercial is to benefit a patient then again you're possibly probably going in the right direction and i've never agreed from the medical side that it's black and white and we can't do this because we're medical it doesn't really matter if if you're medical or not if you're doing the right thing for the right reason for the patient and you're following company guidelines and, and country regulations whatever they are then then you should be doing it and you should be doing it together but the, you've got to have that understanding uh, and some common sense and grown-up behavior which um, would drive hopefully the right behaviors and the right activities yeah and i love what you say about the core principles and lucy you mentioned integrity and actually the last webinar i did with rena uh, for the DPU was around, you know, compliance in digital, et cetera. And, and Nick Broughton was on there and he, he was always very clear on if you start with first principles, then you can't yeah. go very wrong, right? Are you doing it for the benefit of the patient? Are you doing it with integrity, et cetera? So I, I, I can, it's interesting we say about the insight. So I think what, what I had in my head is that you're not allowed to talk about the conversation you've had with a customer, with an HCP, but Rena, that's clearly not true. So what is it? Why is it that I always hear that, oh, the MSL can't share the conversation that they've just had, which from a commercial point of view makes you feel as a representative uninformed and cut out of the picture a bit. So what would they be allowed to share in terms of if they were setting up a new pathway or something with a clinician? How much of that it, from a code perspective, not a, a company perspective, would would or should they be allowed to share? So, I mean, that's a, that's a really good example, because what a lot of companies do is to mitigate risk, they will adopt a position which, is, I mean, you know, Lucy said it beautifully, no one no one can operate at code standards, you have to operate at your SOP standards. If you operated at code standards, you'd have to do a shed load of monitoring on a daily basis. So, you know, if there was a conversation that had occurred between an MSL and a clinician, we have to think, what's the biggest risk? If an MSL acts as a rep, so in other words, they recount the conversation to their sales colleague and they say, go and see such and such and flog the drug to them because they'd be great at prescribing it, then they've acted as a rep. And it's literally that scenario that we're so scared about, the if, what's, maybes and possibles, that we go, do you know what? Just don't share any conversation because that's the safest place for us to be. And, and Helen, from from your perspective, when you're helping individuals, and as you say, they're coming into this complex farmer environment where you know there's this commercial over there. Just talk to us a little bit about from an MSL's perspective on this. What are their fears and concerns? Is it as Rena's spoken to that it feels like they can't even talk to a rep just in case, or do you get the impression actually that they see the opportunity and it's clear? 
I think it depends on the organization and it's, you know, it, it will vary hugely. Um, I hear many stories of, of MSLs who enter into organizations and they're not clear on the expectations of them in their role. They believe that, you know, that they're, they're there to be a scientific communicator. I, I mean, I, I heard a story last week of, in fact, you know, he told me this firsthand, this individual who had joined industry, a top 10 pharma company, and he said, I had no idea there was this chasm between myself and my my sales colleagues, and it was never, you know, never shall we in, engage. But if we if we take a moment, so there's just two things I want to say. One, coming back to our customer, our physician, let's stand in their shoes. They are not differentiating. They see us as the face of the organisation. So unless we have that clarity around who, you know, our roles and what we're there to do, we can't expect them to differentiate between us. But we're also in this world where we're having this, this spotlight in medical affairs. There's all this talk about being medical and this strategic role that we can play. And if we're really following that through, and we're doing a lot of this at the moment, if we're really following that through in terms of are we as medical engaging in accordance with our medical strategic plan, the activities that we should be conducting should be sufficiently different from those that are being conducted by our sales colleagues so that we are collectively aiming for the same common purpose. But I think in the absence of expectations, in the absence of people having clarity on strategy, we start to walk into the wilderness. And that's what we see. So you made an interesting point there. And I know we're very much talking about the field, but, and we, we said, you know, the, the, the head office is a bit of a separate animal, separate beast, but actually mm -hmm. your strategic plans that happen at that point obviously affect what filters down to the field. So I don't know if anyone could talk to the collaboration at that point, because if we're collaborating there and we start that process, is that a bad thing, a good thing? Does it happen? I don't know if anyone could speak to that. I don't know if that happens, Lucy or Mark, in your organizations, or are they very much, you see them when they're done rather than you collaborate and think about the overall shared goal that Helen's been talking about. Yeah, but I'm not involved in that kind of process now as status because of my role, but, but in previous organisations, they should be done together. It should be a joint collaboration when you're developing strategy, whether you're commercial, medical, market access, whatever. Um, and you should, you, as far as I'm concerned, you can give advice to each other and you can give your ideas and opinions. One necessarily shouldn't be directing the other one and dictating what goes into a, a medical plan or commercial plan, but you should be doing it jointly because, as, as Helen said, your, the common goal is to benefit patients um, and you need to combine your your resources, your energy and what you're doing. So it all, it's all synerg synergistic and adds together and definitely not do it in isolation. And it should be a collaborative effect and that should filter down to the field teams. And that's where you'll have your more specific field, your medical tactics, your commercial tactics, et cetera. But it should be joint uh, from top down. OK, we're, and to Helen's point of this shared, like we're all about patient outcomes. It just so happens that in commercial, that's related to one or two brands in that area. And my belief as a commercial representative is I believe this brand is best for those patients. And therefore, the more of it I can get used, the better the patient outcomes MSLs have that, but at the end of the day, we're funneling through to the same outcome. Lucy, do you have, uh, and I know one of the things that you're keen on is one customer view. And yeah. you know, if you've got one customer view, that I know it's the strategic plans are about all customers, but nonetheless, the strategy of understanding customers and acting to their needs needs to be within that plan, no? Yeah, and I kind of, like, it makes me think towards what could the future look like? What would I want in the future in a dream world? Um, I think it is that kind of like, let's look at the customers. How do we have a holistic view of you know, what, what what's happening in their world, what they want, what they need. And then that kind of dictates the strategy and the plan versus what we, what we have in our functional roles. And obviously there's, um, there's clear differences to some degree in the tactics, but, and the approaches, but actually the, the insights, the data, the collection of the the information that drives that. I'd love if it was all 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 together, and that's what was driving our strategy and and plans from from a, a, an omni channel point of view as well. You know, you think it's not just 
people that we have interacting with customers anymore. It's lots of different ways of reaching reaching HCPs. And some of them are promotional, some of them are non-promotional. But how do we make sure that all of those together provide an experience that is what they need, want, and are looking for? It's it's certainly what the impression I'm getting from across the industry is a is a top-down directive around we need to understand our customers better as an organization. Because without that, all of this investment in digital channels is just the equivalent of a shotgun, right? That's a bad analogy in healthcare, but you know what I mean? We're basically spreading our messages widely in the hope that they'll stick to some customers. If we want to capture insights, and in fact, when I did a presentation for Peter Llewellyn on the um, uh, Medcoms network, and I was felt desperately out of my depth in sort of Medcoms and MSL world, I went to, and I didn't find the MSLA's website, I did find the... I think the US College for Medical Science Liaison Managers, and they had a list of all the things that an MSL should be doing or the, the, the sort of charter, if you like. And third from the top was to provide insights into the clinical world and the and the 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 the, the, the therapy area that can inform commercial. And that feels the, no real code in there, right? Because that, that's just above an individual doctor. It's not, not promotional. It's insights that go into the commercial strategy. But... I'm I'm still a little stuck on the insights of an individual customer because if we drill down to that one customer, so Rena, from what you said, mm -hmm. there is nothing in the code that says that an MSL can't speak with a representative and say, I thought you'd find it interesting information about the doctor that I've just seen. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. However, right, if you think about what Lucy was just saying there about, you know, we've got all this information and data about customers, it might not always be in the same place, though. So just to give you an example of what could go wrong, and to my knowledge, and I know a lot of case rulings, there hasn't ever been a ruling about this, but it's a theoretical possibility. And that is, say you've got 10 bits of insight about a particular doctor, and it's been, you know, they've been collected by somebody in sales. And they're all very much about their attitudes towards a particular medicine and towards prescribing it. If an MSL saw that data, or vice versa, you know, and the MSL did an activity that was then subject to a complaint, if that information then came out, that actually what the MSL was doing was deemed to be promotional, but look at this, they had access to all the insight and information about the prescribing habits of this doctor. What does our defense look like? So we end up, it, because we can't even get our head around what that defense might look like, let's not do it at all. Because well, that's hard work. And I'm not mm -hmm. saying that we're all shy of hard work because we're not, but that theoretical possibility of a you know a case that's never happened is enough to scare us into going, yeah, let's just keep it separate. Even when I joined the industry 25 years ago in MedInfo, we weren't allowed to talk to the reps about a response that we might be sending a doctor. And it comes across as a trust issue, right? It looks like reps, we don't trust you to open your big mouth. But really, it's not that. It's because it protects them. If they've never seen the info, then in any defense, we can say that they never had access. They never had access. Does that make sense? I can, can I comment on the whole insights piece, James? So yep. just building building what Rena has said. You know, people talk about insights being the currency for for MSLs, and I think I think where we need to be really clear is that the insights that might be of interest to our colleagues in sales, in my view, are different to the types of insights that we would expect MSLs to be gathering. But the insights, so, so if you are being directed to gather insights, and we know that for many people, this is their reality, you will, the behavior that you adopt will be in accordance with the direction that you are being given. But insights, in a sense, are really about seeking to understand what are unmet needs, what are your interests. This is not necessary. This is not about your prescribing habits. It's about your patient interests. It's about insights that are of value to the company. And in the absence of the MSL of having clarity on appropriate topics, then they'll just go out and gather a bunch of information. So this whole insights piece becomes an even more of a grey area than, than we're currently describing at the moment. So it comes back to clarity of expectations. And, and there's a whole 
uh, other webinar on what's data, what's insights, what's knowledge and what's wisdom. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, we, we do bandy the word insights around a lot. And there's, you know, not a lot of clarity on that. I want to take Rena's point and to a degree what you've said, Helen, and flip that around. So what you were saying, Rena, is that fear of a complaint and how the hell we handle it makes this feel like it's not worth doing. So if I flip that and say, why is it worth doing? Why is it worth the risk? Which is probably the whole point of today. What is the potential upside um, for everyone on the panel for having more collaboration that we're talking about right now between the commercial field team, or let's just take an individual rep and an individual MSL and an individual doctor. Let's take a single use case. What can you imagine it being the benefit to that customer? And it talks to Simon's question in there, which is, do our HCPs care that we're different people or different roles? And so what is the upside of taking the risk that Rena described? I think it like in its most basic level, it's, you know, imagine, imagine, you're an individual HCP and you know, in the most basic way, you've been visited really frequently by, by different people from the same company. And it's just not a good experience. So it's 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 providing an experience that is focused on the individual versus focused on our individual roles. And it doesn't necessarily have to be insights, deep insights, sharing of information. It, it might just be as simple as let's not all go to the same place at the same time. <laughs> Yeah, I think historically we worked in silos. MSLs and sales reps tend to have a very similar target customer group. There's a massive overlap. And as, and as Lucy said, they because of the way we metricize both sides, they tend to compete for the same customer because we measure so much by activity and it drives the wrong behaviors. So you do get duplication of effort, um, which isn't beneficial for anybody the organization and the customer nor the patient so i think it's partly historical for how the industry still metricizes its its customer facing teams and until we move away from that and move more towards customer value net promoter score and work in a joint up fashion where genuinely the right person sees the customer to meet that need it shouldn't make a slight bit of difference whether it's a rep or an msl as long as they're meeting the need of the customer and the customer can then treat patients better that should be the positive outcome not that a sales rep has seen 20 customers this week or an MSL has seen 10. That should be irrelevant, but unfortunately, we don't live in that world. Some companies have taken that bold move and use net promoter score now as a big part of their incentivization. And you can only get a positive net promoter score if you're working together jointly, because that's what it's measuring yeah. is the whole experience of the customer. And I think that's probably where we're heading in the future. If it'll happen in my lifetime or not, I don't know. But it's it's got to be a, a better way forward than the way we've worked historically in the industry. Well, if we think think about the the journey of the commercial field team that have been around a lot longer, um, the, the rep 1.0 was the really bad old days of pure relationship and dinners and all the rest mm -hmm. of it back in the 50s and 60s, especially in the US. I then mm -hmm. was in the next generation as a rep 2.0, which is the sandwich board rep. You know, I had five brand key messages to rattle out to 10 doctors a day. I used to see in a day what people see in a week now. And at one point when I was in primary care mental health for Lily, um, it was long enough ago, I'm sure I can say this. There were three of us calling on the same doctors in a mosaic pattern. And oh. actually, we didn't even know who'd call. We were supposed to communicate. But back in those days, you know, a doctor would say, I've just seen one of your colleagues last week. Like, what are you going to tell me that's new? Oh. So I feel and and the evolution of rads into cams and all of that, that we have this key account management approach now, which should be a, a lot more thoughtful about who and why we're calling on them, B, how we orchestrate that engagement. And at the moment we've been on that journey in commercial. It seems odd that we're doing it in isolation. And now we're not, it's not a conversation that's happening with the MSL because as you say, the experience, the customer experience is not, the individual it's the whole thing and that's non-personal as well it's the whole omni-channel piece so the better we understand our customers the better the non-personal engagement the better we collaborate in the field the more joined up that feels to the hcp helen in your experience with the people you work with any anyone else thinking oh sorry not anyone else do you feel that msls you work with are thinking in terms of and i hate to use the word customer experience i wish we could get over that yep. they're all customers they're all hcps but you know the people we call on well, I sincerely hope they are, because we talk, I mean, at the core of what we talk about, we talk about the triangle of success, which is 
you know, at the base you have engagement excellence, scientific expertise and strategic acumen all around mindset. And mindset for us is it represents many things. It's, it's being aligned on a common purpose. It's about patient and stakeholder centricity. It's, it's this idea, back to Lizzie's point, it's this, this idea of, you know, we're approaching with one voice, with, with, with one heart, really. And I think that, you know, the question that you asked, James, was what is the benefit to the customer? I think the customer's needs change. You know, we, we have this, this assumption that, you know, they have the same needs. And unless we can build trusted relationships, we can't possibly know how their needs are changing over time. So we have to align, we have to agree that we're going to approach it with a collective mindset so that we can really ensure that we are addressing their needs because their world, you know, their, their reality and their world is their time poor, you know. So what is it that we have to offer that's going to support them in their world? And I think it comes back to mindset. Okay. And Lucy, I'm going to come to you for, for an extension of that because I think of all of us on the panel, you have that a role that has overview of all kinds of different functions that you can bring to bear from, if I remember rightly, from L&D to the commercial team, to the omni-channel, et cetera. And that has to be driven from custom needs that do change over time. I don't know if, we, if you've got, you could expand on, what am I going to with this? The, if that's the desire, how are you bringing those different things to bear? And obviously you can't check the most sensitive stuff, but what, like the importance of bringing those together to work in concert for the customer. Yeah, I think, and, and in my in my view, just I'm not saying this is how it works at the moment in the industry, but the the future, you know, should be more personalised. I think it's all the things that we've said we want to do around having really really granular detail around different segments and personalization and how we get the right content at the right time, right channel, which could be a field role or could be a digital channel. And, and trying to go on the journey of doing that in a really methodical way that takes you closer towards being more personalized and data driven and, and less about the kind of we need to see 10 people this week. Let's just crack on and, and try and do that. Um, but it's definitely a journey. I mean, yeah, I think there's probably been many webinars already on this subject of how do we get to that that personalized place? And clearly, I mean, not everyone is there. <laughs> And, and that's the that's the the point of having you know capability building data generation frameworks digital teams who are helping us to move along to to that place and it's it's actually i mean obviously completely different but you know i've i now take really keen attention to how i experience things as a customer so you know like i've had a vendor who recently asked me to go to a face to face meeting and they sent me the email before and then I saw them at a congress and I had the the conversation with them and then they introduced me to someone else who's in a different function and like you said you know I don't, I don't know what their roles are in in the company all I know is what what I need and and what they're providing to me and how useful it is really can I can I pick up from that do you mind James no, of course. at MSLA I presented this sort of it was part of a workshop and I presented what could be the future and said that if we're really genuinely you know true to our word and we're really about what the customer wants and the customer experience then how about a farmer field surgery so actually the customer wouldn't know who they were dealing with but if they had a need whether it was education a question congress invite whatever it was they would visit our farmer surgery and actually i was shot down and i don't mind saying it because mark and helen were talking about the importance of relationships and i'm just intrigued on this point because it's sort of become a dirty word as far as field medical is concerned because who owns a hcp relationship is it commercial or is it medical no none of us right so if no one owns it then why can't we have a pharma field surgery? Why was it so important to maintain relationships if no one really owns them? So you, can you expand on the concept of a pharma field surgery? So it would be like, a, like think of a doctor's surgery, right? I have a need, I ring them up. I go through a triage process. I might see a nurse, I might see a doctor, I might see a physio, but my needs are met. And I don't really know, and I don't really care which one of those is doing it, 
but my needs are met. And actually, if you think about how a clinician might have a med info request, does that go to an MSL or med info? You might have a question about a licensed medicine. Does the rep take that? Do they hand it over to MSLs? It's quite confusing even for me. And that, that's been a challenge even before Field Medical existed. Um, and it's now more than ever a challenge because there's so many different ways to engage, you know, from a pharma website, which have been around for decades, admittedly, to emails, to Viva Engage, to, you know, doctors.net in terms of going for, there's, there's, as, a, as an HCP, I can go to a thousand different places to find information and I have my preferred route and there's a whole other topic around, you know, what influences a decision. So your proposal is that they would just go to one point, ask the question and we'd react with, who should respond to that? Not not necessarily even a question. They may well have a difference. I think, I think Lena's idea isn't isn't a bad one, but I think if you if you put it in the omni-channel world, that is one channel that a customer could go to if that was their preference. If you look at the data for field medical post-COVID, the vast majority of countries globally have gone back to the way they were pre-COVID. They want to do face to face. They ha they're happy doing virtual. Um, interactions are probably higher than they were pre COVID, um, but the virtual piece has kind of sneaked in and taken over 20, 30 percent of the face to face. People are people. They they want to engage with people, but at, sometimes they may not want to. They might want to do a, a clinic. They might want to go virtual. They might want to go to a website, and that's what Omnichannel is all about: is giving them the options and the preference to meet the need at the time. But you're not going yeah. to replace human beings hopefully because otherwise we'll all be out of jobs 100 percent. and lara uh, good to have you on the in the audience lara has, has said exactly the same thing which and, and that's why we have field teams right yeah. it is about personal relationships and building those over time etc um as to who owns a relationship i also got shut down for this when i was suggesting that now from a making sure that we create a great customer experience from a personal point of view i'm a great believer in someone orchestrates that Right. And the, the thing, if you're the orchestrator, then you find out someone from the head office contact them about attending an advisory board and you didn't know. And then this, that and the other or a classic example. And we can strain slightly into Omnichannel here that an email is sent promoting a clinical study or a tool, an online medical education tool. And it's sent to the author without addressing them as the author. Right. So how do they feel now from a customer experience point of view? But I'm getting into Omnichannel now rather than field of medical but that personal relationship it is a, it is a difficult it is an interesting question if we reverse and say who owns mark the key account that's who 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 owns the management of a key account rather than the relationship with an individual customer um why did you ask me that question because um, <laughs> you said your key account was key um it's a really good question i think i think the key accounts i keep hearing from key accounts it's owned by commercial i hear Omnichannel is owned by commercial. But then if you read a medical thing, they'll say, well, actually, Omnichannel should be owned by the MSL. So I don't think there's one size fits all. And I think it's probably it's probably driven by the needs of the account and the customer. Um, and some might want it to be owned by one, some by the other, and some probably won't care. And they'd like to see multiple people, multiple owners, because they all add value in different ways. They behave in different ways. I've never really liked the ownership principle, and that's a customer. Unless that's what the customer wants, I've never really bought into the, someone owns a customer because people are different. They offer different value. They behave in different ways. It's not your title or your function. It's what you offer in terms of value and how you do that. Um, but I think it should be customer driven. It should be account driven. Um, and I think the ownership always pulls into problems of who actually who actually drives that, and then you end up. I'll probably going back to more of a siloed way of working and an ownership way where that customer's mine and then they won't let go of that so i think it, that can cause challenges but there's probably not one size fits all well i guess that's the reason we have key accounts is we can collaborate around the key account and all the customers because it's customers mm. are individual customers in the nhs yeah they are yeah. they are part of a large organization with restrictions and guidelines and collaborators and referrers and treaters and all the rest, which is why we've moved or should be moving, I hope, to key account models. And I've I've got um I've got one here. And Joe's been posting a lot in in here. Um so uh, and uh, I said that I was going to open up the mic. Joe, do you mind if I open up the mic to you? I, I just think I'm really interested in your last point. So Joe posted in the QA about the MSL uh uh college is revealed let me um find you joe uh, if that's okay yeah uh, one second 
Joe Steele. Hi, Joe. Can you hear us? Hi. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, um, I was really interested in your in, in you pulling out the last point. I don't know if you want to just uh, just pricey uh, what you put in the chat in the questions. Yeah, thank you. So it's just really a point that we're grappling with at the moment in my organisation um, in terms of you know what what sort of can be shared and and how can that be shared, and you know to Rena's point, there is a, a a bit of a lack of guidance coming from. The code and um, you know one of our reference points has been the um, MSL um, guidelines that I posted which actually don't seem unless I'm wrong they don't seem to have been updated since 2018 but it does seem that there's some very um, um, sort of tight much more tighter restrictions uh, in that particular MSL guidelines document which is obviously a guideline but it is global um, and I assume that um, a lot of um, organizations would would look to follow this in terms of this MSL activities and um, as you can see, like the, the sort of the, the final couple of bullet points are really quite restrictive about not sharing um, information about um, tactics um, and and sort of you know get, keeping the information sharing a very high level um, and and so you know this is what we're really grappling with is that we 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 would like to share more and we understand the reasons for wanting to share more but um but uh, you know what what are the the views of the panel on this on this guidance and how widely is it um um it, uh, applied um from your experience please so i'm not sure if everyone in the audience could see the questions so i'm just going to read out the last bit to make it clear so this is the um, MSL Society's 2018 guidance, and the last line of it says, tactics and plans for stakeholder engagement should not be shared proactively. So I don't know if we'd like to comment on that. I mean, shall I go first? I'm sure we've all got strong comments on this. So Joe, absolutely, I'm really glad you asked this question because this is the kind of stuff that our global colleagues will pick up and then it'll be in a global policy and then it'll get filtered down throughout the affiliates. And the thing that's missing is there's no explanation about why, like what is the risk? They haven't actually said, why can't a tactic be shared? Or for example, MSL should not share info on the perception of stakeholders, why? So it's always useful in instances like this to pick out a really simple analogy. Let's pretend that we wanted to train a sales rep up on an unlicensed indication. A lot of companies would go, that's not allowed. The code doesn't say it's not allowed. So then we'd say, well, why isn't it allowed? Oh, in case they bring it up proactively. I'll tell you what, we'll mitigate against that by telling them not to do that. Done, risk mm -hmm. mitigated. So it's all a case of going, why the MSL Society done that? Because it's a global guideline, because there are some areas of the world that are risk averse and some areas that aren't. So in order for a global guideline to work, it has to pander to the lowest common denominator. So that's my opinion. And, and actually, we had a question from, I think, from Anil, uh, Annie, um, who's international, asking, you know, we're, we're focusing a little bit on the UK here, not a little bit, quite a bit. And Mark, you have a global role, right? So how does that resonate with you, what Rena said? And do, is, do you find that the UK drives things or more restrictive drive things? What, what's your experience with those sort of global guidelines impacting on activities? Um, no, I agree, I agree with what Rena said, and I disagree with that, the that society comment. I mean, you can't you can't work in partnership. You can't do key account management. You can't do omnichannel unless you're sharing information. Um, the more you share, and the more you do stuff jointly together, increases risks. But then you need to look at what is the benefit and justification of doing that. Um, and we, you know, key account management. I know there's a question on can you have joint plans for key account management? Can you have joint KE development plans? If you do them jointly, you, you can, and you and you and and that would increase the transparency in the communication, but you do also open up more risks of one driving the other or off-label stuff coming into the equation. You can, you can do all of that, but you just increase the risk. And then you need to balance up from my perspective, what's the value versus the risk? And if there's a massive value and people are behaving as grown ups, then great. But if the if the value doesn't justify it, then then why put yourself at risk and keep things safe? But you should be sharing and you, did, you just need to be clever about it and you need to be pragmatic and realistic. 
but ultimately you should be doing what you can to optimize benefit for the customer and the patient. Can, can I just add to, to, to the point that was raised by Joe? I, I was involved, or I certainly had sight of those guidelines, and you're absolutely right. They go back to 2018. If you want to look at something that's more current, look at the Paul Theron and Co paper from 2021, which was promoting best practices for MSLs, which was a position statement, which came from APA, MAPS and the MSL Society. So that supersedes what it is that you're, you're seeing. But I, I completely agree with um, the, the, the points that are being by, made by both Mark and Rena on this. Just going back to Joe's other comment, I think we've created We've created silos for a rep versus an MSL when we assume one is promotional, one's non-promotional, one talks high science, one doesn't. Um, there's no reason a sales rep can't talk high science on label. There's no reason a sales rep can behave in the same way an MSL behaves. They can be customer focused, they can be patient focused. And you mentioned earlier on, James, a sales rep always wants their drug to be the best and the only one ever used. But that surely is is a stupid way to work in terms of credibility and trust because at the end of the day the customer wants to be confident whoever it is talking to them is actually trustworthy and giving them a very open honest and balanced um, response that benefits patients and the long-term gain for that is massive whether you're an msl or a sales rep so hopefully on the commercial side that is changing and and sales reps are realizing it's all about trust and credibility and long-term relationships that ultimately is better for the organization from in terms of a commercial success so but it's again it's a change in mindset and companies will be different well i, I partially i partially agree with that um I, I do like a fair and balanced approach should be intrinsic to everything we do and obviously talking in label and oh. making any claims that are unfounded or not supported but equally i think as an industry we start to be embarrassed about selling and at the end of the day, if I believe my product is the best for that particular patient group, I shouldn't be embarrassed about selling. I, that's why I'm in the room with the doctor. And if I help the doctor with other things, I'm doing that to facilitate yeah. and it, the opportunity to use more of my product. And to, 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 to suggest, and I think Roche have gone down this route, we're no longer, our, our reps no longer sell, they just provide service. I personally think stake, shareholders in Roche will be regretting that decision in a few years' time. Right. Yeah. We, we, we do. We, we're a commercial organization at the end of the day. And there was an interesting challenge from Richard right at the beginning is medical is kind of part of commercial because as you go far enough up the tree, someone uh, is commercial and someone's you know, responsible to shareholders. It's not a charity. Um, yeah. But that doesn't get away from the fact that I must get down the tree that, you know, we, the patient outcomes is at the heart of everything. Yeah, I, yeah I, don't, I don't disagree. And I think even for an MSL, if a, if a clinician has a view on a competitor data that actually isn't accurate and your drug is actually better for that patient population, an MSL should challenge that as well because it's a peer-to-peer -peer relationship based on the data or based on the science. And that isn't, for me, that isn't being commercial or promotional. That's actually trying to do the right thing for the patient. So it, it goes both ways. Um, I just wanted to say I have been educated today because I have never, I have never seen or knew that there was separate guidance from the MSL Society for, for how MSL should should work and goes back to my at risk of sounding like a broken record point of why it's super important that individual companies teams have their own guidance guardrails because otherwise I mean for the question how do you know which one that you're following you've got to you've got to do that work I think um okay so um I think we we've we've talked about stuff but i'm going to stick with it a bit because there's a number of questions that all relate to this and if we are putting the hcp at the center key account planning is really important right that is the idea of understanding the environment in which the hcp is operating understanding that forgive me from a commercial point of view what levers you pull to to make that a profitable account for you commercially from an msl that account is about how can we maximize patient outcomes regardless of brand there is a huge overlap clearly in trying to do that can we just talk again and we maybe have talked we let's just clarify again there is nothing getting in the way of an msl and a representative maybe with their area manager sitting in a room and going how do we approach this account it's purely the fear of that if there was a complaint 
how do we defend the fact that they're in a room and it might appear it's a commercial discussion, not a key account discussion? Yeah, exactly that. And I think one of the healthiest things a company can, can always do, whichever area, is to first think of compliance and list the risks. Just by listing the risks, which is a very healthy exercise, you can then go, right, how are we going to mitigate each one? You've always got the key objective in mind. You've always asked yourself, why are we doing this? If you can really understand that it's important enough, you will always find a way to do it that will be compliant. Always. Even if it's a list of, you know, 25 different activities, it might be hard, but it'll still be compliant. And I think, you know, like what makes a key account commercial is a question. And does does the key account manager have a commercial role or is it more of a or the orchestrating role? It is what I think. It, you know, like the true, again, maybe outside of pharma, the true account management model is somebody who's bringing in the right stakeholders to the right stakeholders on both sides and putting them together to to get the right outcome not necessarily any functional kind of alignment their job is just to to orchestrate the right connections Helen again to your experience working with individuals and with companies like you, you, both you and I and Rena have a, a a really broad view of the industry because we work with a lot of different clients which you know Mark and, and Lucy are really dependent on their current and past organizations in your experience are you aware of anyone doing this right now in terms of that level of collaboration with or without a clear set of risks and guidance are you aware of msls and representatives yep. working together with the interest of the customer yep. hcp center okay. yes absolutely and 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 actually you know i i get really disheartened because when when you see this working in practice the level of satisfaction, the level of pride that comes with knowing that collectively we are contributing towards a common purpose, that, that you know, the, the whole cultural piece, the whole environmental piece is incredible. I just get dismayed when, when I sort of sense these, these chasms that are existing, these tensions that are happening. And, and I, I understand why it happens. But I really do think that, you know, what the advice that Rena is giving is, you know, collectively think about it as we're, we're an ecosystem. We're, we're, we're one as opposed to fractured functions working in isolation. And in fact, we just had a question posted by an anonymous attendee, so I can't open up the mic. And, it, and it's an extension of just what you were saying there, Helen, and what we're talking about, this one customer view, this customer at the centre or, the, or the, the key account. Is there any evidence or published data that shows the impact of commercial and medical collaboration on patient impact, HCP engagement and satisfaction, stroke, sales? There's probably something on sales. I don't know. But do you know in your experience, Helen, of those people that are doing it, is it being approached in a consistent, measurable way or is it just people pushing the envelope and hoping it's going to work i th I, th I think that the evidence that you're referring to is it's kind of this, this holy grail that we're all uh, coming back to the msla um james you know demonstration of measures of and impact and i think we're working really hard towards identifying measures that more appropriately reflect reflect the patient outcome that we want to to see so i don't think we're there yet i'm not aware of it in, in terms of publications but i think that we're, we're trying to head in that direction well mark you you were on a panel at the msla when i was there around measuring and specifically around msls that conversation was in field medical around measuring impact and we you discussed on that panel obviously patient outcomes is the ultimate measure but it's a, it's a lag indicator. And for us, it's often confounded by multiple factors. You can't really say this activity led to this and associating it. Have you reflected on or taken, what, what would you, patient outcomes is the, is the ultimate measure, but it's difficult to do it. What, what do you, in your opinion, would you deem success in terms of CAM collaboration between an MSL and a rep as a proxy indicator of, of success? Um. <clears throat> There is data, well, as you know, there's data for commercial when one cam is done well, that it increases commercial return. Um, and I think it's 
you can always make the assumption that if 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 one cam or key account management is being done jointly by all customer facing teams that's going to be a better experience for the account and the customer so in, you know, you're going to expect better better outcomes for the patient and and for sales if you're sitting in commercial um but in terms of measuring the impact of 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 the field medical function that is still that's still a big challenge um it is hard to measure. It's hard for companies to measure if you're trying to measure patient outcomes because then are you actually using your teams to be commercial to drive sales? It's always a, a vicious, again another vicious circle to go to. But I'm I'm just I mean I'm sure some people in, on the call and definitely on the panel have seen data from Viva um, to show that field medical um, when um, when you compare field medical activity in a in a new TA pre-launch versus where field medical weren't involved is a 1.5 increase in uptake of new medicines. We all know, we all expected that because we all see the confidence and the education that field teams give clinicians pre-launch and post-launch. So it wasn't a surprise, but it's the first time I think ever that that has actually been quantified in a blinded fashion. It's been done independently by Viva, um, but it was done using claims data in the US. So they, there's a lot of companies that do use things like claims data in the US to identify you know, patients that aren't diagnosed, um, patients who are undertreated, and potentially target medical activity to those cohorts because that's where you're going to have a bigger impact on patients, and then you can measure the outcomes. Is that a commercial thing to do, or, or are you actually optimising your medical resource to benefit patients? Um, I don't know what Rena thinks about it, but we, we have data now, and it's getting close to that being a commercial thing or actually are you doing the best thing for the patient because we can measure it now um and we can measure scientific share of voice and sentiment even in uh, in europe now in the uk so the more data that's becoming available the more we can measure and it's getting closer to the patient and the impact of medical commercial or joint activities it's a changing beast and it's gonna it's gonna challenge people like rena regulatory authorities etc because it's 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 becoming more open and transparent and it doesn't say medical is not being medical or being promotional it's actually it's the impact of what they do and what they've always done and they've done well mm. I do. I, I knew you were going to pull that one out and throw it at me, but um, I was prepared. <laughs> so I do think actually when you read that stat, that's actually quite hard hitting and you sort of go, oh my God, that can't possibly be compliant. But it's the same thing as just um, as, you know, uh, how does an MSL discussion with a customer affect, for example, um, patient outcome? How does that actually happen? You know, there was there were way too many steps there to say it's because of that one but you know so what we could argue is how do we know that that msl you know discussion that was being had at that very early stage was related there's too many factors and like you've just said about confidence and education and awareness and all that kind of stuff so it needs way more work than yeah. than to just say have msls in pre-launch and your product will do better that's a terrible message to send out yeah and I also think it doesn't matter. I mean, I've been at sales conferences where the commercial teams have been recognised for great success in sales, but you also know the MSLs have been engaging with the same customers and having good conversations and increased confidence. So it's never down to one function, and you can't always claim it's down to medical commercial. At the end of the day, it, does, it shouldn't really matter. But pre-launch, it's slightly different because there isn't commercial activity. Um, but at the end of the day, it's multifactorial. Is it is it not fair to say that the use case for field medical and medical itself is to create an environment in which a product can be used effectively right so and and it's and that's why we are allowed to do it pre-launch we why medical allowed to do pre-launch talk off license but essentially they're creating an environment in which the product can be used but as they're doing it other products can also be used and whilst that is a commercial driver like make sure that the environment exists for us to use a product bear with me it's still a benefit for the patient outcomes, but it wouldn't like the industry's not going to do it. It's not done purely charitably, is it? Well, it's to Richard's, Richard's question, right? Are we all promotional? And I would argue it's not in the code, but it is in the law. Having a scientific service to ensure the appropriate use of our medicines is a legal requirement on us. And the functions like med info and pharmacovigilance and the support functions are there for a legal reason, which is more than the sales force are. So actually, we're not all promotional because we're also product license holders. So we have a duty and ethical responsibility to make sure our, our products are used appropriately. 
should. <laughs> Uh, up on um, I think we have someone from Medallia in the in the Q and A, and um, maybe the point around how can you measure impact is it goes back to that customer experience. And I think I don't want to misquote anything, but I do think there is quite good evidence around having a good seamless customer experience, which is the question um, that that can actually show really good impact in terms of the rating NPS that kind of okay. thing. So I think that is something we can we yeah. can do. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, um, let, let me um, bring uh, Nigel. I'm not familiar with Medallia, but let me bring Nigel in because he's got some questions in there and you've raised him. Nigel, is it okay if we bring you uh, into, I've just asked you to unmute if you want to ask one of your questions around this because Omnichannel is collaboration um, and does talk to this point. Sure, by all means, thank you very much indeed. And great to meet each of you. So, uh, Nigel Herbert from Medallia, for clarity, Medallia is one of the, the world's leading um, experience management organizations, not what we say, but what the industry analysts say about us. Um, a question really is, is around, you know, a lot of this is about um, how do we join up not just the insights, but the data and the intent of what um, effectively the, the HCPs are thinking um, and even their patients. And how do we actually effectively um, orchestrate that experience um, that each of those stakeholders has to provide the optimal support and uh, empowerment for those individuals to make the right decisions. And experience orchestration allows you to do just that, to move beyond just capturing the digital experience of your HCPs or your MSLs or even patents. And it allows you to reveal insights about, um, about that engagement, which then triggers personalized real-time interaction across all channels. I'd be keen to understand precisely, you know, what the, the consensus is within pharma as to how some of these emerging technologies that we now have can really make a difference. So thank, thank you for that, Nigel. I will uh, point you at our YouTube channel and the event that we ran back in, gosh, whenever it was, called, excuse my language, what the fuck is Omnichannel and will pharma ever achieve it? Right, so that, and that was... Um, you know, the, the whole conversation around the potential um, hiding behind omnichannel, saying it's a technology solution, but underpinning it all and where we came to as a conclusion is it's an attitude, it's a strategy, it's an organizational wide. And actually that talks well to this discussion. And let's, let's take your point and lift it up a bit, slightly out of field into the head office, because essentially most of the channels aside from the field channels are a head office responsibility is, and I'd be interested here, if we're the same principle of how can a CAM and an MSL or a rep and an MSL do key account planning, is how can medical and commercial, or how do they currently interact when it comes to the non-personal channels in creating that experience? And can they? Can an insight derived from an MSL engagement recorded to the CRM be transferred to the Commercial CRM, it's the same thing, but let's pretend they're separate because people like to pretend they're separate. Transferred and allow the representative to use that insight to act or allow a non-personal promotional activity triggered by an MSL engagement with a client. So I'll give you a use case. MSL uncovers a clear treatment challenge that the HCP faces. That goes into the CRM. Is that allowed to trigger an email journey for that customer based on that need that contains some promotional items? So the question would boil down to, has the MSL acted in a promotional capacity? No, the organization has. No, no, it's not about the organization. That was the MSL insight, right? So we can't just say it's at a higher level. Did that MSL contribute towards the prescribing decision in a positive way because of what they contributed, in which case the answer is yes, they've acted as a rep. And that would be the case because they, unless they didn't know the insight would trigger that. Well, even then that's the organizational responsibility, right? But then it goes back to this, this really fundamental question of why. Why are you sharing your insight if you don't know what it's going to trigger? So I, I, I'm, I'm feeling, Mark, maybe your current role, this isn't as easy for you to comment on, but Lucy, this is kind of I'm guessing one of the things from a one customer view is we talk a lot about creating personas and journeys etc and creating a great customer experience between and a big challenge between how personal and non-personal interact effectively but what about 
promotional and non-promotional medical and commercial journeys for HCPs. For a great customer experience, they should intertwine. They should be one. But can they? I don't know is the answer how I have not I have not got there, I think is is the honest answer. I think I could see that there is a way that you could share data that is indicative of the activities that have happened, the touch points that have happened. Um, but going into the the flow of how do you get from one point to another point and mixing that all together, I don't think is something that that's happened and I think that is a long journey ahead. I don't know. <laughs> so, well, we're talking about how two people can just sit in a room and communicate. The idea of then how their insights that they derive go into an automated marketing or medical platform. Yeah, I can imagine that's the that. But but it, yeah, it, it's an end goal, surely that everything joins up in a, in a compliant way that creates a great customer experience. Um, so, thank you for that one. Um, but uh, uh, let's focus back on the on the field. Uh, interesting, uh, Robin Maiden has made a point here. We were talking about um, does collaboration impact um, on outcomes? So Robin, you put a, um, and we talked a bit about ownership. Robin, are you okay if I open the mic to you and you could maybe comment on that? Are you with us? Hi, James, yeah, I'm here. Which bit would you want me to comment on? The, 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 the bit of evaluation work that we did. Well, yeah, because it's a, it's a key, like uh, it's a burning platform for a lot of anyone in the field. Like, how do I measure? How am I? I, I was surprised at the MSLA, the fact that MSLs were now subject to to reach and frequency targets. I thought I, I thought that was a no no for a start. I didn't even know that was even possible. But I can also understand why a large organization investing millions and millions and millions of pounds into the field wants some sort of reassurance that the activity is paying off or is being done, etc. And that led into the conversation we we're having earlier, which is how do we measure impact and how do we, how, actually, I know what it was. It was when Rena was saying, look, this is the potential negative that's scaring people off is how do I defend the claim? And I flipped that around and said, well, what is the benefit of taking that risk? What is the outcome that's desirable enough to take that risk? And I think at that point, Robin, you posted about the evaluation work you did on true CAM collaboration. Yeah, okay. So uh, myself and some of my colleagues um, worked with, a, I'd like to think that they're a relatively evolved pharmaceutical company in one of their, in one of their global regions, not, so not the whole globe, and it wasn't UK specific, um, where they measured, and it wasn't a singular time point, uh, to, to the point I think Mark was mentioning before, is that the role that we have for MSLs and reps, there's a time-based period as well over which there is an impact, as in, an MSL may be more around uh, generating an environment in which clinicians are more aware of possibilities for the future. And then the sales rep is more the striker at the football team scoring the goal at the end because of all the hard work done by the rest of the team in advance. Um, hence my question about bonuses, but I'll come to that later. We worked with this team for about three years when they had introduced a key account model, which was focused around the single, the singular idea of the customer at the center, not the brand or the franchise even. It was more a put the customer at the center. And we measured the impact on sales. That was one of the measures. But we talked more widely about ge general impact on the relationship and trust with the customer group over a period of time from an approach that was more around their needs at whichever time point they had up to and including the prescription to a specific patient at some time point. And it was much more that evolved mindset. I think again, Mark was the one I can remember talking about trust in particular. Trust was a major factor on the impact and it wasn't just NPS that we used or, or, or a, uh, excuse my French, a bastardized version of NPS, but essentially an NPS uh, calculation. And that organization then rolled that out more globally, that, that CAM structure. But it took us a long engagement, a lot of stakeholder discussions internally because people didn't buy it. And they, we needed to show over a period of time that working together ultimately helped that organization move forward because they had a more evolved and i think again the words have been used by the panel a more grown-up way of approaching the business so it does exist 
but I've not seen it in many in many companies to that extent. And that evaluation, so within the CAM model, there was medical and commercial in-field collaboration around. Yes, Full, fully transparent. The IT structure didn't allow for it. So they had to operate outside of the CRM because the CRM didn't allow for it. But at a key account, customer at the center discussion, supported by a head office and regional function that allowed them to build a plan that was strategically aligned but the implementation was designed, who is the best person to provide whatever information or support, because it wasn't all drug related, it was support services in addition, which was a big part actually of, the, of this, where medical was a better avenue to providing what the customer needed at the time point. Sales remained the uh, orchestrator, because someone has to own the plan and feedback and whatever else. But they they even looked at sharing, and I've made the point in, in the question, that the, the, some of these particular people, based on the geography and the culture of that team, they, they shared their financial benefit <laughs> with their friends by by on, a, on an informal level saying, thank you very much, you helped me achieve this bonus, but it wasn't all down to me. That was completely outside of the company stuff. That was more because they were friends and they wanted to be egalitarian but it did show that teamwork was far better uh, than purely sales saying, I want this from all of you people to, to make me get to where I want to go. So that, thank you, Robin. I think that's kind of what uh, we're all hoping for, right? So seeing it being done, it kind of speaks to Rena's pharma field surgery, which is whatever the need, the best solution is applied, whether that's a person, an MSL rep, et cetera. Is there a comment from the panel on that? Is that something that, that from a Nirvana point of view, that that's what we're aiming for? Is it's it? Possible? A, it's just a general one linked to that and also linked to Omnichannel. If we're going to do it properly and joint up, we also need to devise joint objectives. Um, commercial have adoption ladders, which medical don't like, but we need to have common direction whether it's for an account what is a key account what is the direction what are you trying to achieve we all, we need to have joint ones so they can work together and, and they're driving in the same direction and so it, it can't be about the commercial and it can't just be medical but there is ways you can do it i wouldn't say we've done it and the answer yet but if you've got different objectives and going in different ways it's going to be very difficult to work in harmony so we need to start thinking about how can we jointly have objectives that are appropriate and compliant and customer focused, patient focused. Uh, so there's a lot we can do to harmonize it. And I think it's going to evolve over time. But to do it properly, I think that's where we need to go. It's not easy. I don't know the answers yet, but we are starting to talk about that sort of stuff. I, I like the uh, striker analogy, because I think, as you said earlier, Mark, it's, it's a team effort and yet the striker gets oh. the glory, right? I'm not sure reps... Yeah get exactly the glory these days i'm not sure it's the most glamorous of roles in most people's perceptions but uh yeah the, the end credit if you like for for everything begins and finishes with the whole organization and as oh. i've always said we're all reps we all represent an organization it doesn't matter if we're in field or not hmm. Thank i you. just want to say to mark about the adoption ladder there because i've not heard that one before that medical don't like adoption ladders i can quite understand that it doesn't surprise me but um, I think that Viva data shows us more than ever that actually we can have adoption ladders for our MSLs and customers. And it can be about their awareness and understanding of the disease. Mm, yeah. It doesn't have to be about. Yeah. 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 Helen, you, you must have experience with that. Yeah. No, funnily, we're, we're, we're working on a project at the moment. And it's really, it's, it's thinking about, uh, we talk about scientific acumen, scientific awareness. So going back to the point that Robin made about this, you know, creating this awareness of the possibilities, creating awareness, you know, if our ultimate goal is to provide our physicians with the information that they require to make the most appropriate decision for their patients, and that may or may not be our product, but it's, you know, if we want to be truly fair and balanced, but we, we are then able to say, okay, in terms of our level of engagement, where do we believe they are in terms of their scientific understanding and awareness so that they get to that point where they feel 
that they have enough information. So yes, whether we, we you know, you hear about sentiment analysis, adoption ladders, and so on. And, and again, you know, this debate goes on. But for me, really, if we if if we provide in, you know, if we provide them with the right information, so that then they can ultimately make the right decision, then I think that it is appropriate that we can say that this is where we believe we are in our journey with them. And if I can make a, a point on this as a, a noisy chairman, adoption ladders, commercial have had decades of experience with them. And I would, and it's good that they're being adopted. And Lara's made a point in the chat, you know, that, that it's a, it is a useful measure, but always, always bear in mind it's self-reporting, right? So you're basically asking the field representative or MSL to move a customer or an HCP from one position to another because they feel or understand or believe that they have done more. So the note of caution or the caveat I'm putting out there is it's really, really important to make sure whoever's responsible for doing that has really, really clear understanding of each levels of that adoption ladder. What are the criteria, behaviors, and beliefs held by person in position one, position two, three, four? Because often, especially in a CRM, adoption ladders are reduced to numbers. Ah, oh, there are now in a one or a two, et cetera. So it's really important to communicate often and frequently in, in their workflow what it really means to be an early adopter, what it really means to be a regular user, what it really means to be a champion or, or a, 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 a champion of your brand, et cetera, because it's self-reported and goes back to KPIs and the importance of it. If we are measuring people on how quickly they can move people through the adoption ladder, there's a temptation to move them quickly through the adoption ladder in the CRM, even though that's not being reflected in clinical or... And, and I think I think you would find that some people would, would not agree that adoption ladders are appropriate for medical. And I think we've got to be really careful about that because that comes back to intention. So I think that... I think trying to understand where somebody is with respect to knowledge is one thing so that we can identify how we, you know, how we can best support them, how we can best engage. But I think beliefs do drive behaviors. So is it the behaviors that we're looking at or is it knowledge? And mm -hmm. for me, it's, it's kind of, I, I think we should be thinking about it in terms of scientific understanding as opposed to beliefs and behaviors. It also, it also impacts how you, you use them if, if you set them as a strict kpi or target people will hit that target because that's what you've set and that impacts their behaviors and for msls in particular so if that's this it's proactive behavior to hit a target then you get into bigger risks about proactive um, promotion off label promotion so you, is this how you use them again and, and historically companies have kpis and strict targets but they're great to show the, the value and impact if they're used in the right way and, and as helen said that the criteria yeah. in them are appropriate um but they might must be ways to combine these of course medical and commercial so we have a common a common direction so i've got a talking point i want there's one last talking point i'd like to bring someone in to raise and then i'm going to do a quick summary and we're going to come to you for a word of advice on what people can do differently um uh, as we're coming up to time paul dixie the inimitable paul dixie for those that you know him has asked a particular uh, uh, as usual, controversial or, or thoughtful uh, conversational point. Oh, uh, Paul, can I bring you in just, why not? Let's let's ask this question. Hi there, afternoon everyone, can you hear me? Yep. Cool. Um, I think it comes back to one of the questions that was asked right at the beginning of this conversation and Rena made the point about if an MSL is going to be promotional, then they need to take the exam and be qualified as such. And I wonder whether it's just a simpler and perhaps stops this sort of dancing around on this sort of the, the head of a needle is to simply classify MSLs as a promotional channel and provide them with the appropriate training and certification. It doesn't mean that the MSLs and commercial reps can't continue to have their different discussions with different objectives with their customers, but perhaps removes that gray area, given that they will have, as it pointed out by the, the IQVIA data, their role in and encouraging the use, the appropriate use of a product is the same as the commercial rep. So would it just be simpler, and I put this out there as a, as a talking point, to simply classify all those, the, the MSLs and the commercial reps who have touch points with HCPs as commercial, as promotional, 
and it therefore removes an awful lot of discussion around those grey areas for discussion. Would that then preclude them from talking off-label pre-launch? No. No? Short answer, no. Um, so 100% yes, that that wipes away, wipes away that compliance risk that I mentioned right at the outset. Make them a dual role team that yeah. can be promotional and non-promotional. We talk about this, I mean, nearly every year at MSLA, we, we bring this subject up and there are dwindling numbers of companies that utilize dual roles. The reason being that they have a big MSL team and they have a big sales team. So they don't need teams to be dual role. But if you approach it in the way that Paul's asked this question, does it eliminate compliance risk? Given that the only risk of an MSL acting promotionally is that they haven't got the ABPI reps exam, yes, it does. In fact, there was a, a company that we used to work with in Cambridge who um, made all their MSLs sit the reps exam. And when I asked them why they were doing it, I always go back to that key word. They said, in case they do something promotional. Now that doesn't mitigate risk. You can't accidentally fall into promotion. You have to be properly trained and briefed with the right materials to act in a promotional way. So then James, to your question, could they then never do a discussion? No, they can. Because if they're dual role, what it means is sometimes they wear a promotional hat and sometimes they wear a non-promotional hat. What I think is not well known is this has always been the case for reps. Reps have always been able to wear a non-promotional hat and companies have never fully utilized that. Yeah. So a really simple example, a rep sometimes drops off patient support materials. That's non-promotional. So why, 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 go on, Mark. What, just, why? No, just one caveat around the dual role. There's, um, I doubt many of you have seen it on the commercial side, but there is a lot of MPS data. I think it's about 30,000 plus um, clinicians have done net promoter score, independent research globally. Um, and it, 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 it tells you the behaviours by the MSLs that have solicited a positive, negative or neutral net promoter score. And it just shows the importance of perception from a customer perspective. So being a rep one day and an MSL tomorrow, isn't a divide for the customer because you can't be both in the customer's eyes potentially. And the negative net promoter score was was um, linked to having a company agenda, company spin, being promotional, um, not being customer focused, not being patient focused. So it does have an impact and it, it, it applies to sales reps as well. If you solicit those behaviours, you'll probably have a negative impact. Um, but it's really powerful data and it shows the importance of behaviour and the importance of perception, whether but, you're an MSL or a rep one day or the other. But that you're talking about a dual role, not an MSL being trained. No. In the ABPI. So no, no, no. I'm just if we divorce about... those two things and just say that if we want to create great HCP experiences in a joined up way around key account management and they can collaborate on this, not to then go off and do a dual role, but just at that level to mitigate the risk of oh it was promote would that would being taking would an MSL who'd taken the ABPI training in an environment, in a collaborative way, talking about customer insights and key account management, strategic planning, does that eliminate that risk that we talked about earlier, Rena? Yeah? You're on mute. You're mute, Rena. You maybe heard me lip read, yes. <laughs> it, does, it does eliminate that risk. But yeah, I just have to have clarity that this is a... This is the promotional hat of my role that I'm wearing in the same way that a rep would do that in a non-promotional capacity. But it's not in front of the customer. It's on behalf of the customer at the strategic planning key account management. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing that stops it. In fact, the very old guidance that the PMCPA used to have, which mentioned MSLs, which has been archived now, had a really amazing line in it. And that line said... You know, basically, they were saying all of this is acceptable under the code. But the more you give a single person to do, the more risk you introduce. Mm -hmm. I mean, an MSL is non-promo. Theoretically, they can do ad boards, press releases, market research, the whole shebang. But we don't give that to them to do, right? Because that's way too much. So if we're going to give them promo and non-promo, we're just introducing a huge element of quite a lot of risk. Mm. Okay. Right. I'm conscious of time and I can always see it. it's always good at the end of urban. I see people dropping off from the participant list as uh, real world um, pressures come into play. So um, um, 
It's difficult to summarize, other than we're all aligned on the importance of achieving this on behalf of our HCPs and customers, and that that may be best from a key account management point of view. And I don't think any of us really believe in a single person owning a single relationship, but more in working together to enable the key account. And maybe there's an ownership of the key account, as Robin alluded to. We've learned that there is way more that we can do around that key account in terms of collaboration, but it's a risk, but it's making sure that there's clear communication and that the benefits outweigh what is always a risk. And that's true of almost everything that we do in this industry. We may have also learned that we could just train the MSL and the ABPI and mitigate that risk, but not the dual role bit. And there is clear reason from what Mark said as to why those dual roles might be fading out because of the impression from the HCP rather than the benefit to the company. Lots to take in. I hope you found it useful. I'm going to now ask each of the panelists um, to give if they had a word of advice or a sentence of advice or even a paragraph of advice to anyone listening as to what could be done differently tomorrow to maybe increase the potential or the collaboration between functions for the benefit of our HCPs and patients. Uh, I'm not going to pick on person. Who wants to go first? I'll maybe go first and then I've got mine in. Um, I think mainly all problems and all things in the world can be solved by just sitting down together and saying, like, how does this work for us? How, how are we going to make this work? And then putting that into some kind of formalized way of working, getting it agreed, you know, just take the time to say, this is where we want to get to. How are we going to do this together? Oh, you ruined it there, Lucy, by saying, take the time. That's the thing that we're all too short of, right? And rushing from one thing to another doesn't allow us the time to stop and think. But make this is really important. So maybe we should make the time. Make the time. Thank you. Who's I, next? I would echo everything that Lucy said. And I think great collaboration for me is a consequence of great attitude. And the two words that I see and hear, you know, in those teams would be teams that ask why and teams that are us are saying yes because if they start with those words they end up all working together automatically why and yes thank you next um i would just say that i still hear of msls and sales reps not wanting to work together and i think they we need to stop that and people need to realize we're all here to benefit patients and and as lucy said we can do most things if we do it the appropriate way and we need to think about the end goal and the end objective and stop working in silos because we need to do it better going forward particularly in an army channel account management world thank you helen no pressure as the last one to give this advice but what would your advice be um ensure alignment of understanding through the provision of strategic thinking and acting training for field medical so that they see how their role is contributing to the overall business success Lovely. Well, there you go. You delivered on that as the last word. So I'm not going to put anything on top of that other than to say thank you so much, Lucy, Mark, Rena, and Helen for your insights and experience. Thank you to everyone that asked questions, joined the chat. Uh, sorry if we didn't get around to all the questions, but I think we pretty much covered them. There were some that were drifting into Omnichannel. I'll point you again at WTF, the Omnichannel on our YouTube. And uh, maybe that's another topic around uh, medical Omnichannel on another webinar thank you very much everyone um it's been a, a, i hope you've enjoyed it and look out for the next dpu event which should be in uh, about eight weeks time thank you everyone and have a good evening